I'm not aware. Pack four. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Customer Success for Startups. I would like to introduce our two speaker panelists today. We have Brady Harrison. Brady is the Director of Customer Analytics Solution Delivery at Count. And next to him, we have Rich Stuppy. Rich Stuppy is a customer facing, revenue generating technology executive, and he is also a founding executive at Count. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Mike's working. Check, check. Cool. Um, so the real impetus of this is in Boise, there's like a growing demand for customer success. There are a lot of uh, B2B SaaS startups in Boise, and we have some real internal expertise um, coming out of the valley. And there are some business killers, right, in customer success, and you know who better to ask how customer success can supercharge or kill your business than our local expert, Rich. Um, and so if you're ready, we'll, we'll jump right in. I'm, I'm ready. And I just want to say, Brady and I have uh, worked together, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, something like that. Um, and he's a, he's, a, he's a wizard. And uh, one of the, uh, the right-hand people that took over when, when um, I left Count and it's in it's in uh, good hands, and look forward to talking customer success with you today. Learn from the best. And so, you know, there's not, especially at the time you started, there's not a customer success degree, not in, not even customer success departments. You know, walk me through kind of the career journey from your background in operations to this whole new field in SaaS. Yeah. So to give a little background on uh, count. Uh, it w uh, developed into a global leader for internet fraud control. Um, so that means helping companies protect themselves from people that use stolen credit cards, stolen identities, stolen credentials to commit fraud anywhere on the planet. Uh, we started in 2006 um, and, and progressed along the way. Eventually in 2021, uh, we were acquired by Equifax for $640 million. So my step in the journey as being there when it uh, when we started and we started literally uh, no customers no revenue no product uh, eight and a half by 11 piece of paper and I was uh, one of the founders that was brought on board to do the technology infrastructure and compliance I went from there uh, and it you know when it's three four five people you, you, you wear a lot of hats. Um, uh, from there, we realized after we had actually hired a salesperson, which is a really novel thing to do for a SaaS business, that we needed somebody to interface really closely with the salespeople and help translate the technology magic to customer-facing uh, uh, lingo, for lack of a better word. And uh, so I took on, in my spare time, what would be called come to be called technical sales. From technical sales, uh, we kind of figured out we needed something called a uh, product to help match the needs of the market to the needs of the, uh, the understanding of the business and the technology folks in particular. From there, so I, I became VP of product, from there VP of operations, uh, to COO, to chief customer experience officer. So. Um, I had good feel for how the entire company worked because I had been involved in it, um, and uh, a couple of one of the big milestones in the company was we got acquired by CVC. Uh, uh, they took a majority investment for about eighty million dollars in twenty fifteen ish, and so uh, that brought with it uh, uh, nice operating funds little bit of money for the founders to take off the table, uh, some ballers on the board, um, and a lot of operational expertise that we didn't really have. Uh, the board uh, uh, was amazing, very helpful, very scary, uh, really knew what they were doing. And uh, uh, how I got into customer to be exclusively responsible for customer success was uh, the, boor the board said uh, to our CEO at the time, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, 
We don't really know what Rich is, but he's definitely not a COO for this company. And um, that didn't, uh, and Brad had to deliver that message to me, and uh, I wasn't super excited about it hearing that. Uh, in like retrospect, 10 years later, I'm like, that's maybe some of the smartest input I have ever gotten because uh, like I still don't know what I am, um, but uh, it was very helpful. So they wanted a single executive to be completely responsible for the customer. Um, we were hitting our marks. We were uh, working our way to being a rule of 40 SaaS company, which is a very rare uh, thing. If anybody wants to know what that is, I can explain it. But um, private equity f firms, uh, have basically a three to five year plan to 5X their money and uh, being, being a, managing an, a growing customer base is a big part of that. And you have to do things like find new ways to make money. You have to stop the leaky bucket concept, et cetera. Well, and, and I think you're interesting because you're like, this, I was like, oh, this is not the news that I wanted to hear. I think most people feel customer success is just a marketized customer service. You're like, oh, I'm just the frontline agent people. And you're like, oh, now I'm just in charge of the big cost center. Like, what I say doesn't matter for the roadmap. What I say to all it is is just like, we'll just throw bodies or money at it. Yeah. Rich, can, can you define customer success? As Only, you say? Yeah, sure. So uh, there's, there's, uh, varying definitions, but what has mostly been come, it's been come to be explained as uh, in its own definition, which is uh, particularly in B2B software companies, it's particularly uh, focused on uh, making the customer successful, uh, understanding the uh, customer needs, helping to translate those needs into products, uh, uh, and also taking the wheel uh, on, uh, in a proactive fashion, and that proactivity spans a lot of different things. But first and foremost, the mo single, single most important thing in customer success is the money. Um, pe people forget or sometimes have a hard time bringing themselves to say, uh, the thing that's gonna keep my company alive is the money. And uh, so customer success helps uh, expand accounts that have been landed. They help uh, find customer uh, uh, success qualified advocates, customer success qualified leads for sales, and in some instances, close deals. That's customer success. Customer service is more reactive, so helping with immediate needs. Uh, the word call center comes up a lot. Um, when I would talk to somebody and I would explain what I did, which I was uh, rightly or wrongly pr proud of, um, they would say, oh, so you run a call center. And I would have an allergic reaction to that because I'll tell you one thing we damn sure didn't do is have a, we, I mean, we weren't a call center. We were, a, uh, we were experts in our field helping people solve real problems. And that's the differentiator for folks is the, the, the metrics totally change. And I think that was probably helpful for, for CVCs are like, we're not measuring tickets answered or you know, first response time. It's like NRR, net recurring revenue, right? We're measuring, for some people it's seat expansion, right? For us, we're, we're not a seat based, so we don't really care about, or don't really care about seats. But that's where the metrics change, and I think that's probably helpful. You know, how do you directionally define those, right? NRR is definitely, that's expert decision based. Yep. Like when we talk about why it kills companies, like everyone knows what like CAC is or cost to acquire a customer, but people don't, they focus, oh, we got to acquire people cheaply, but it's like, then what? Like you got to keep them, right? The leaky bucket is the company killer, right? Spend a lot of sales and marketing dollars and then you do nothing to keep them or learn from them. So what, what are some other kind of, you talk about rule 40, but what metrics define customer success versus customer service? Sure, so, um, so uh, NRR, net revenue retention, so that is uh, understanding of your customer base uh, that you had last period, um, how much money are you making off of that customer base this period? Uh, cost to customer acquisition, 
uh, net retention, you'll have some measure of you'll have some measure of uh, customer satisfaction. My pref my preferred method was MPS uh, because it's kind of un somewhat universally applicable. I, don't, I guess you can't be somewhat universally applicable, but um, it's widely applicable. Uh, the uh, other, other really important metrics uh, f for me were, uh, again, the first rule is money. I, the way I thought about metrics is uh, really basic. Start with, what are the things that can kill your company? Um, and then expand from there. And what are the things that contribute to the things that can either make or break the make make or break the company? I shouldn't st say it in a, a, a kind of a negative and, and risk focused way. But when you're starting out, um, or when you've just taken on a, a big investment, or when uh, it's starting to get really complicated because you went from 100 customers to um, 1,000 customers to more, more, more. Like, you have to recalibrate a whole bunch. So uh, we, we would really think hard about what our, um, what our expansions were, how many customer success qualified leads we would provide how many deals we closed on ourselves, how many advocates we turned over to uh, marketing. We would also think about uh, the top dissatisfiers uh, across the entire customer journey and who was working on making those dissatisfiers go away or explain our way out of those dissatisfiers. Uh, uh, things of that nature. And it gets all the way down into, after you get really good at signal capture, it gets all the way down into what are the fill rates of your APIs for a particular customer on a particular day? Are they doing anomalous things uh, uh, on a particular, for a particular time period? Uh, are they chasing, Are they, is your click tracking following the appropriate journeys? Um, and you, div you then you divide those into, uh, for me and for us, we divided those into really two categories. One was uh, uh, health factors. So would they, would the presence or absence of this metric or the rise or fall of this metric uh, contribute to churn or revenue, right? And then. Uh, or would it contribute to churn? And then there, there were growth factors that what made, what makes uh, a customer, what signals do they give off that indicate that they're ready to buy another product, to take on uh, new capabilities, to be upsold in, those, in some respect. And so from a, you talk about technology, right? You never, you're always kind of the redheaded stepchild in the org because, and we'll talk about this in a metric, like. Is customer success cost of goods sold? Is it OPEX, right? You can really set yourself up poorly, depends on where you define that, right? In a startup, everything's about the multiple. And right where you hide the cheese for your customer success cost can put you know, negative impacts on multiple, right? You put it in OPEX, you're like, okay, this is kind of a flat number that if, as the company grows, we're not growing that in time. But if you put it in cost of goods sold, you're like, well, for every dollar, we sell, there's 10 cents of customer success. And then that is not necessarily true, but then they'll apply a smaller multiple to your business because they're like, oh, well, they're not going to grow 10x from this number. And then we forward out that projection of company value. Now they're only like five because they're more of a professional services business. The interesting bit when you're this kind of secondary one is we've talked about don't be the secondary roadmap where you know, there's so much money and customer stuff coming in that it can be really like marketing and sales is going to talk to the board and say, we need this functionality to land this customer. And you're like, we can attach a million dollars to this new functionality. CS is going to go, well, we think potentially if we have this thing, we'll reduce churn by 5%. And they're like, well, a million sounds a lot better than five. And so then you get shunted into your own, like, okay, yeah, we'll work on that later. We'll work on that later. We'll work on that later. Right? How do you separate that out so you're not just 
like always the back office stuff. Um, I think probably leverage outside technology, right? That, that's probably the most common, right? Rather than rebuilding the wheel. You know, what is that, you know, I, when I started account, we had already kind of gone through the majority of the selection process and found like, hey, this is the thing. Why, well, you know, what was, was that historical experience that you're like, oh, I've seen the roadmap, the parallel roadmap go bad? Or where you're like, I think this is just based on the return on investment of them having them work on our stuff and us having us work on our stuff is way better, right? What kind of path did it take? Yeah, and, and I think uh, every company's journey was going to be different. There's somebody really smart once said, you never step in the same river twice. But every company is going to be different. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the experience that I had. Uh, the, the, you're t you described multiple things there. And first, I'll start with the parallel roadmap. And the parallel roadmap is the concept that um, uh, the really, I think, very uh, dangerous and frustrating concept that you're going to rely on your own internal IT team to help build all the tools to instrument and monitor and make CS uh, successful and take, and take care of the customer. Um, I've always found that you end up in the, uh, you know, the cobbler's kids running around in socks because, uh, and holy socks at that, because you just never get your own stuff made. We really started to hit our stride uh, at, in a, at a really, really basic level where we said um, uh, we have things that we need a, a data analytics team to deliver as part of the product. Well, they need to sit somewhere, have them report to customer success. That gave us the b ability to um, be our own detectives and add professional uh, IT skills, kind of the shadow IT. I, was the, I tried to make it the shadowiest IT mm -hmm. possible, like the lights are off and nobody knows it's happening, but we're still, we're still working. And that, that, we started to get clues, we started to get signal capture. Some, a lot of it was SQL that dumped to Excel that's dumped to a dashboard, like super basic, not impressive, not, uh, not impressive, but important. Like, uh, and that was, the, that was the, the impetus of how do we take this and plug it into a system? Well, go out and look at a SaaS system uh, that does this for you. And they were just starting to become real and viable. And it really gave this, the basic work that we did up front with uh, one, getting the resources that could do the data capture for us, made it super easy to do the integrations with these other platforms. Because when the tech team t would come and tell us, that's going to be two months work. And I've got a, a data analyst that you know can spell PHP, um, goes and prototypes it in half a day. Then you like or use uses Postman to do curl calls, the same things that we do on our onboarding process, and our IT team. Uh, rightly or wrongly, was telling us, like, it's going to take too much. We just did it, a lot of it ourselves. Um, and then when the compliance team said, you can't send our data, our, our data to, to these third-party platforms, I'm like, I think you're working for the wrong company because we rely on our customers to send way more uh, regulated data to us than... We're at, we're going to send to these other third party platforms. So, you know, let, uh, get over yourself and um, let's, 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 let's start making progress. And it just, it just built, it just built our practices out so much better because, and it, because it really helped us fill up the framework that we got, we got excited about for customer success. And, and we're both big framework people. I'm like both big wide readers for like frameworks that may not be material to fraud or B2B SaaS. 
that are like, oh, this is a helpful way of organizing the world. And a common one that we talk about is this like buy versus build thing. You're like, we, let's say we have a million dollars of IT spend. Would I rather spend that on rebuilding some customer success tool that is A, probably gonna be bad, and two, um, going to be expensive, or and then take away from the opportunities, like, hey, we are making money hand over fist selling this revolutionary, like, fraud thing, why are we having somebody who's an expert in keying and linking figuring out how to send an email alert? Like they can do it, but the opportunity cost is relatively high. And so that's where we have this like buy versus build of like people stay within your core competency of develop development in your org. And like you shouldn't buy everything, right? There's some easy stuff. Like we started like we probably shouldn't have bought before we figured out our metrics, because then we would have just spun our wheels forever. But we're like, hey, we have our metrics figured out, and we're seeing bad things are happening, and we're having to curl through these like by hand, and then tell our customers there's a problem, which was like really revolutionary at the time, because we're like, oh, we're predicting that they're going to have a problem, and then tell them before they know about it, and then they think you're prescient. You're like, oh, they're really watching all the time when in reality it's like oh i got an email in the morning and it's the number went down so i tell them hey this number went down this is why this is how you can fix it and that totally shifts from customer service to customer success but we didn't have to have a six-week build process we're like okay we'll spend some money and we'll get this figured out and then let this company handle sending the emails and scoring and integrating with salesforce versus you know, spending a million or $2 million to have something that's worse. And so that's like the kind of the company killer in customer successes is either doesn't happen and you're just like, hey, you'll just deal. So then you start, you have the leaky bucket problem. It does happen, but it's bad. So you have, you spent $5 million to prevent $100,000, $200,000 in technology cost. Or maybe you even build it and it's great and then you missed out on some innovation that your competitor is doing. And so that's like why this can kill your company because you can just take a, what seems like a silly misstep, like, oh, we'll just make this ourselves, we're smart people. And you're like, well, yes, um, but do you wanna deliver and support and maintain? Like you signed up to fight bad guys, like not figure out customer success, health scoring, email generation, right? That's not where the people's core competency is. And so talking a little about frameworks, I think we have a similar method for like, before we talk about um, finding frameworks, you, you mentioned a little of like pushing the edge, right? I always think of this as like the cowboy framework. And we've talked about this a little. There's, for people who live in Idaho or the West in general, there's a genetic uh, marker for like adventure and independence that comes for people who were part of westward expansion. And so it is inherently in like an Idaho company's DNA to like, we've never done this before. Because can you imagine you're like in Boston in the 1830s and you're like, you know what I want to do? Take a six month road trip into the unknown, right? Only crazy people would do that. And so our DNA is full of those kinds of people if, you, I, if you've been in Idaho a long time. And I think that was a big part of our framework success is like, What's the harm in trying? Because we have a cool thing here. So walk through that process, because that, that's a pretty scary to be like, hey, we're gonna go after this big fish, and one, it's like the dog catches the car. Oh shit, we, now we caught it. And it could go very poorly, right? How do you do this kind of like coloring outside the lines or kind of cowboy stuff, like the bias towards action, essentially? Yeah. The, uh, the, uh, so uh, what Brady's describing is uh, knowing when to violate some of the core tenets of B2B SaaS. And one of the core tenets of B2B SaaS is recruit the right customer, right? If, if you recruit the right customer, everything is supposed to get easier. Um, uh, yes, but no. So there's also this uh, spirit of um, what can we do and who's going to do it for us? Who's going to do it better for that customer than, than we are? Um, can we uh, perhaps, if 
the whole company is aligned on in a risk-taking posture. Uh, do do uh, experiments uh, where you where you 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 sign up for a use case that maybe you're uh, or a vertical you're not quite sure you're uh, going to be able to do. Um, the predecessor to, to making those sorts of decisions is having a really strong coalition in the company that ha where people tr people trust you. Um, and uh, that coalition, and it, for customer success, like customer success, one of my tenants is be a friend to all. If sales, marketing, to some degree finance, um, uh, operations, if all of these folks are not coming to you on a regular basis to understand, like solve the, to get clues or solve the mystery, I don't care, they, if they're not coming to you on a regular basis, you're doing something wrong. Um, maybe you're not open enough, maybe you're not inviting enough, maybe you're not interesting enough, maybe you're not helpful enough in, in um, solving the sales and marketing sorts of problems. So if you have that coalition right and you're uh, reasonably well trusted and you've uh, helped people solve their problems, you can be ready when the opportunity strikes of let's uh, uh, I, I have two examples. Number one, let's build another business uh, vertical, another another kind of subunit in, in the business, another revenue producing product, purely out of the things that we were doing uh, and understanding in customer success. Uh, uh, we did uh, one I think we'll talk about later, a little bit ProServe, mm -hmm. like we would we launched a professional services wing. Another one, we launched a completely different sort of, uh, uh, it's called chargeback uh, representment or dispute management. We launched that, basically gave it to a junior, an analytics guy that could spell PHP. He wrote some curl calls. We partnered with uh, uh, the at the time, the largest video game company uh, on on the planet, I think, safe to say. That, um, and out of that little effort, we ended up building a, uh, a part of our business that was making uh, like 15, 20 million dollars a year in revenue. Like just, just for like kind of going for shit. We're gonna give it a try. Let's see what happens. Made good progress. We had another situation where uh, it, it, this is a pivotal moment in, in, in Count's history. We had uh, uh, we had we hadn't launched a partner program yet, and we had a really sophisticated payment gateway company that uh, had we'd been nurturing for six months to be. You know, we've been chasing them for six months, maybe a year. And they started getting really, really excited ab about our stuff. And they called us, or our head of sales calls as the CTO, the CEO, and me, uh, at the time COO, was in a cab in, in New York. And three dudes should not all fit <laughs> in the back seat of a taxi in New York. But there was obviously something in the front seat. Um, and they're like, we can sign this deal. But we knew we had a lot of stuff that we had to like, uh, we, we, we weren't sure 100%. Some, some of the stuff we weren't sure 80%. We like talked through it uh, between uh, Newark uh, Airport and uh, 56th Street. We decided let's, let's do it. We, we launched that um, and we, we were uh, not without a little bit of struggles very successful, uh, that, that payment gateway company, uh, what they didn't tell us is they were in the process of uh, being acquired uh, by PayPal and they needed, the one thing that they didn't have is an integrated fraud platform. And so what really happened is they were sort of betting their exit on us and uh, we're we, like, let's ride the rocket ship together, right? Let's ride the uh, yeah. But they were real cagey about that because you don't you don't say that because I guarantee you the price would have gone up. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so we take a chance. 
and 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 it works out. But that was because the coalition of tech sales and the CEO were there, and um, we trusted each other to, to get that done. Yeah, and it's not a pivot. I think that's the critical part of it. It's not like oh, we're totally we're a startup and we're like we do the thing, things not working. We're pivoting to a new thing. This is a kind of like we're going to do things that are complementary, that are not our core competency, but close. And that we can say, hey, well, let's add value here because we can acquire more, retain more, whatever. But we would not have discovered multiple verticals, use cases without somebody going, well, I think it could. uh, Okay, here's how I would kind of draw it up. And then if you're like, oh, no, it has to be X, Y, Z, e-commerce, make a purchase. And you're like, well, does it? have to be yeah. and and one of the big things there is many of the innovations came from our customers they 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 were like you, you know you, we we started out using it for here our basic e-commerce fraud prevention you somebody plugs in a credit card you do that well it turns out that we have this issue where um, in this other part of the com- company we sign up businesses and our business our ability to, to do uh, principal checks and checks on businesses doesn't work. Well, well that, that became a part of the partner program. Like if you're listening yes. to how your customers are actually using your product, for us, we, 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 got a lot of, we got a lot out of that. And we also got a lot of shit for the idea that um, they're using it wrong. Yeah. And, and like that's one that really gives me an allergic reaction, uh, because I'm like, if they're paying us money and they're using it, I would say we're talking about it wrong. Like if they if they can actually make it work, um, just, why do we care, right? Why, why, like, why, greatest compliment is they give us their money, yeah. and so you're like, if they're willing to pay for it, we should be willing to do it, right? Maybe some qualifications like, hey, this is. This is not the purpose-built thing, yeah. but we can get you time to value. And that's CS like distilled is, I want to work with someone who I like, and I want you to solve the problem that you said you would. Yeah. If you don't accomplish... You commit, though, don't you? Uh, you can. A lot of times, Brady, right? You're like, oh, that sounds great. Then you go off and spend a lot of resources. You're a product looking for a market. And then, you know, you, you can go down a rabbit. You, yes, yes, and the important thing is to know which rat hole to go down, yeah. and and to know the characteristics of to know the characteristics of what's a rat hole and what's what's a, what's not a rat hole, um, and if you can if you can start small, test it out, validate it with with a customer or two, uh, and it, and it makes sense, like that gives. That gives the salespeople something new to talk about, a new potential use, um, and it and it's it's uh, you, you can't you, this is this is not how to this isn't a law of how to do it. This is something to think about while you're doing it. You know you know you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think that the only thing that I've seen that really works in that situation you touched on it a, a second ago, Rich, is making sure you have the right customer. Yeah. Yes. The right customer is a customer that wants to help you with the process, not like, hey, we bought it from you, make it work. And then you're like, wait a second, it's different in this case. And 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 we were really uh, we were really good at finding uh, the way I the way we positioned our CSMs, they were not order takers. They are not uh, Again, call center. These, our CSMs, we look for uh, people with business acumen that are uh, well-read, educated, that someone calls them or emails them or it comes through the system flow, and it is a business problem, first and foremost, and they're solving the business problem, right? And we had a very... uh, good partner in our IT team, the reason we could solve, focus on using business acumen to solve problems like that is because we weren't upside down and underwater with uh, stupid stuff, right? Like uh, we, weren't de- we weren't dealing with uh, outages, we weren't dealing with uh, niggling things that just wipe you out, 
you know, they, if your day is filled with nonsense, you're not going to make any money. Like making users, resetting passwords, yeah. that kind of stuff. The other part is the product org is like very thirsty, like parched for customer feedback and direction. And so they'll pretty much get it from anybody, in my experience, because it's so hard to capture. And what CS can do is like, this is a great customer. They pay us money. They are not the stewards of the ship. But you will find people who are really smart, really ahead of the curve, that are saying, we are having this problem, and we are having it before anyone else. We've recognized it before anyone else. How can you help us? And so that is where you kind of pick, and there's a couple distinct examples in our mind of people who are like, like the business example, they're like, oh, we're having this issue. We're having it before anybody else. Can you help? And then that can help drive you know, real customer feedback versus they just talk to you know, any Tom, Dick, and Harry customer. And, and they don't have to be big either. It's not a revenue thing. Because there are big customers who are dumb and who have really easy, slow problems that are not challenging. And then there are people who are mid to large who are really a four of the market and issues, and they'll say, hey, we're having this problem. And if they're having it, that means the rest of the market is going to have that problem in like a year, year and a half. And they're just trying to innovate themselves. Like when we went to buy online, pick up in store, the first customer was like, how, do, how would we figure this out? And we're like, OK, well, this is not a traditional purchase. How do we manage this? Can we repurpose a field? And then we realized, oh, this is a problem we need to solve long term and then more solutionizing comes out of it versus just listening to any feedback. CES can say, this is a good customer to listen to. They can be the tail that wags the dog because they see problems early. Their team's invested in them. So if we say, hey, here's a product that you can buy, they have the internal wherewithal to be like, we need to buy this. And um, the, the, there's a truism that says people find what they're looking for. There's a fancy name for it, but I call it the green car effect. If you're looking for a green car, you see them everywhere. I forget the name. You don't uh, know to look for some things until you have your mind open that, hey, we maybe we'll go and do this. Like if you find as a CSM, like it's a pretty goddamn exciting thing to say, I figured this out and the company adopted this and it's it's now a it's now a product and they're and they're you're. Your CSM uh, is going to be proud of it. They're going to get promoted. They're probably even going to go switch departments and because they flex their muscle or they'll go into leadership or, or whatever. Um, but the BOPIS one is a really, really, is a, is a great one because that was a new retail thing 10 years ago, right? Um, turns out that exact same problem, rough and tough, exact same problem, similar problem. Um, is now huge in quick service restaurants, right? Uh, and I can tell you there was no way we were marketing or thinking about um, doing uh, quick service restaurants even though they were getting destroyed with fraud as soon as they turned on their uh, app stuff. It, and it's, it's a little bit of pattern matching. It's finding what you're looking for and it's uh, having the... Um, fortitude to, to chase it and to have the, the company's trust that you're, uh, you're qualified to chase it. And those are, those are examples where um, it more or less worked out. Like, the, there's a lot of ideas where we were like, ah, I don't, yeah. no, 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 don't do that. We can't do that. that or we shouldn't one, do that. Or, or we, we, that's an industry we don't want to go into. It, it, like, it's not, it's not do it all the time. It's know that you, you could do it if it is the right time. And that's where you start trying. If you never do it, then you never know who to say yes to. So you say no to nobody. And, and, and you never build the muscle. Yeah. To, you never get to fight and wait. And um, when, when those opportunities show up, you haven't tried it. And it, everything you try the first time sucks. Like at least everything I try the first time sucks. Um, if, you, if you don't practice, you're not going to be ready for the game. Yeah, and you're just making more decisions. So you just start getting better at like, oh, this is a good new application of our tool and technology. 
right? And that can be going up or down market, right? So like, oh, we're having problem. Like we're an enterprise solution always happen. And then it's like, well, what if we're getting a lot of questions from smaller folks? Like we shouldn't just be like, no, we're enterprise only and be like, leave all that money on the table. And so like, let's experiment with a, a light offering, right? How, how could we support, manage, maintain something for someone who's small? Because like, sure, you 80% of your revenue is gonna come from 20% of the customers, just basic Pareto efficiency. You don't wanna start impacting that 20% by going after the little guys, but you're like, still good, still good money there, right? Great partner relationships there, and that's really how you build this like revenue machine coming out of CS. We're recognizing new problems. You know, they're on the phone with their customer, but like, is there anything else that I can help you with? Is like the best question. This happened to me once. We had like a customer, r relatively minor, um, from a revenue perspective, kind of a, a very normal brand, like not not doing a lot from a like not bringing anybody in, not spending a lot. And because we were really invested in these processes of like measuring, monitoring, improving, I like to think of this as forestry management rather than firefighting. Like go spot where problems could happen and then go proactively manage them, right? For a B2B SaaS and us, we have all these metrics that we maintain around, you know, API usage, right, responses, whatever. But, you know, just track when was the last time they logged in, right? They haven't logged in in a while. That's that's a, a part where like, hey, let's re-engage. In any instance, we had proactively engaged them. You know, I was trying to be, uh, try hard, really manage my customers well. Um, I realized if you talk to your customers and preemptively solve their problems, you have less meetings with them. They're way shorter. The everything's great, see you in two weeks is like the best meeting ever. And so those happen a lot more often when you are like, on Wednesday, send them the pre-emails, like, hey, do these five things. In any instance, we had done that for like a year. And then one day on the phone, they're like, hey, could you help us with this uh, insurance thing? Right? We have insurance for our product, and we're getting killed with all these requests for you know, replacements on this product. And I was like, yeah, you do it kind of like this. Like, what's the issue? And they're like, oh, people claim the same thing multiple times. And I was like, okay, well, structure it like this. And they were like, okay, okay, okay. And then they are like, okay, we dug in. Um, we need to change our contract. And I'm like, uh-oh. And they're like, um, we have five X as many insurance claims as we do sales. And so we want to take ourselves from a customer this big, five X that big. And so just by proactively managing their results and experience, they're like, you helped me solve this thing. I don't want to go RFP. I don't want to go back to my technology team to integrate a new solution. Can you help me solve this thing? I'm like, yeah. And we took a small customer, you know, from like in our one of our lowest tiers of spend into like the top like 150, just based on a couple conversations of Hey, yeah, yeah, I think we could we could help with this thing, and and that's the real promise of success is if you deliver results for people, they want to work with you, and they'll continue to invest in you and your business. That could be seat expansion, that could be API expansion, depending on your bucket. But that's that is really why you measure NRR, net recurring revenue, because how often are those conversations and conversions happening? You know, where can we apply this technology in a new way to increase spend? And you do that a couple times, a couple big customers, right? We had one where acquired a fast food brand, uh, have some success. Well, well, they all talk to each other. So you go ask the other one. They're like, who do you use? And they're like, we use uh, this company. And they're like, okay, we'll go talk to them. And they're like, um, what's your results like? I'm like, well, we did this, this, and this. And they're like, okay, we'll buy you. And then that company gets acquired by some big fast food conglomerate that has five brands, and they'll say, Oh, okay, now we'll apply the same technology to all of our brands. And you take a million dollar customer into a five million dollar customer in like two years without like no new sales, right? You just talking to people. Well, I, we, not technically no new sales yeah. because um, it retired somebody's quota. Yeah. You know, yeah, you, yeah. And, and you start retiring quota uh, on behalf of people, and they're going to start uh, taking your CSMs. Uh, on the road with them, mm -hmm. the and it's, everybody likes to get out of the cage every once in a while, right? Everybody likes to go to uh, a steak dinner. Steak dinner. Got to got to get your fillet every yeah. once in a while, and you if and that and then that story goes to marketing because marketing wants to tell that story. 
Um, what Brady did ask about frameworks a little bit ago, yeah. or talked about frameworks a little bit ago. Um, I, I'm a big framework guy. When I grew, was growing up in IT, it was ITIL. When I was uh, working on compliance and controls, it was COBIT or COSO. When it was uh, when I was starting a product uh, team, it was pragmatic marketing. Right. My philosophy is, if I'm doing something, I, my first thing is know that I. Uh, do not know. I <laughs> know that I don't know, right? I was going to be a little more profane. But um, know that I don't know. And then start read a, reading a couple of books. Like I'll, I read, when I got what I thought was a kick in the crotch for this uh, go be the executive over the customer experience thing, I, like, I was disappointed um, for about, I don't know, 30 days. And then I figured out by learning what it could be and looking at the framework from Gainsight, which was a book I, f I fell uh, into, um, I realized, like, I started getting scared because I'm like, this could easily be the hardest job um, I've ever had in my life. And it, it, easily, it easily was. I mean, it, it, could, it is um, infinite possibilities that can touch every part of the company, can uh, can help the company grow. You can do really um, exciting stuff. Uh, and you can be a big part of uh, acquisition or exit, uh, because I guarantee you there's a shitload of due diligence uh, when uh, a company's being acquired or funded about how do you handle your customers and what is your approach and, and how do you prove that's how you handle handle your customers. Like to, to be a to be a rule of forty SaaS company, you really have to know what's going on with your customers. Yeah, and that is a critical piece for me. Is like in, in fraud, especially stuff changes so much. You just have to be like this constant looking for new voices and information, right? You know, you found Nick's Meta's book around customer success just because like that's what people are talking about. Like LinkedIn follows key. Right. How do you find, right? I'm sure people are going to ask, like, how do you find new info? Right. How do you be like, oh, I need to figure this out. First, I like to, I read a lot um, and I read a bunch of weird stuff, uh, all nonfiction. Um, but I also uh, that and that makes me interesting to other people in uh, the field, the firm, the valley. And so. Uh, when I talk to somebody, I get really curious about what they're talked about. Like when we started the uh, AI and machine learning and hired our first uh, data scientists, like the uh, gentleman we hired, he talks about, you know, he, we start talking about graph theory. And I knew a little, I knew the difference between a node and a vertice. And that uh, was about it. And, uh, he, he starts talking about graph theory. So I go out and I listen to a podcast on graph theory and I read a couple of books. And the next time we get together, I'm like, hey, let's talk about how our, if, if, our, if our identity graph represents a scale-free network. And he was like, yeah, probably does, but I knew that, but I didn't think you would even think about that. And that sort of like interest in their interest um, helps a lot. I haven't, I haven't, uh, I haven't been at Count for two and a half ish years, and that data scientist and I still get together to talk uh, uh, mathy stuff, which. If you knew how much math I know, it would you you would shock you that I'm even involved in the conversation. But um, you read a book, you think about some stuff, and if you're a CS uh, in CS leadership or or want to be the best CS customer success person you can be, being interesting to people um, is really important. I, like I think sales is probably slightly more important, but I think a good CS person is basically sales that uh, can, sales that can um, execute on a, on a variety of business problems. You know what I mean? It, that, it's that, 
it's that sort of stuff. Well, you just know what their boss cares about. And so then you can talk to them on an appreciable level. Um, to that end, I've got to ask you qu plenty of questions. Okay. I have lots of access to Rich. Does anyone have any uh, questions for Rich and I in kind of the customer success vein? We have time for probably two or three. So maybe a couple of key yeah. takeaways from the book since you have it there. Yeah. Under oh, um, yeah. yeah, the uh, and uh, I'll, I'll do one better. I'll give you the book if you'd like. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, my, my, my real take in uh, Nick Mehta, who founded Gainsight, the reason they started Gainsight was he was one of the first people at uh, Salesforce. And Salesforce was growing great guns. Uh, this was 15 years ago, let's say. I don't know. The, the, the year isn't important. Um, uh, they were growing at 40%, but they were churning at 20%. Um, and those were monthly numbers. Churning 20% of your business a month. That means five, every five months you have 100% new yeah. customers. Yeah. And they said, took a Mark Banoff was a genius because he said, we need to stop that. I don't think you have to be that smart to say you got to stop that. Just, just. <laughs> but um, so that was the genesis of the customer success framework. Um, and, uh, and churn kills recurring revenue businesses. Um, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't kill them in a humane way, right? Um, that's 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 one big thing, and then the other big thing is principle number one is is it's all about the money. Um, I, the single biggest compliment a customer can give you is paying their bill, and then to, if they want to make that a bigger compliment, pay a bigger bill, right? Um, thank yous and cakes and all that stuff that will not. You know that won't keep the lights on, um, but the the focus on the money and understand that you can do great things. You can be a very uh, kind and service oriented person, but if you're not focusing on the money, you're missing it. Any other questions? Probably got time for one more. Yeah. These um, like, for, firstly, uh, firstly, um, early days of any company are fraught. Like, they're 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 dangerous, um, and be and in the early days, we didn't have the customer success lessons. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't. Our 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 first customer success person was uh, an operations guy that worked for me because he knew how to do a curl call, right? Um, and that's all it was. It was an API interface. But we built, we built, we built, we built from there. So without these principles, I think you're dramatically increasing your likelihood of failure, um, I think, uh, for the company. I also think that customer success uh, over the course of time is going to be viewed as uh, vastly more important than it is now. And it's going to be, uh, there are going to be degrees about customer success, there's going to be academic research in customer success, and there's going to be massive value created by B2B software companies in particular because they get this stuff right. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Key, 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 key to multiple expansion is keeping your customers not putting process over results, right, is real key, right? For every dollar you add in and keep, whatever your multiple is, like SAS, try to say double digits, that's $10 to your total valuation, right? You get a customer to renew one extra time. I think we got people in the back 
Yeah. You're waiting to set up. Yes. So are you guys waiting to set up? No. Yeah. Okay. There's a talk at three. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. So uh, on that note, um, you know, you can reach me on LinkedIn. You know, rich big LinkedIn guy as well. Yep. Yes. Yes, Ed. Uh, uh, my new gig is I'm at uh, Vision, that's V-I-I-S-I-O-N, and uh, we're a company that's a, primarily a blockchain company that's helping brands use uh, patented technology to tell their story and prove their story, um, all, of, all with data. So it's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna be a super fun thing, and I'm looking forward to um, a, another good run. Yeah, it sounds very exciting. Well, thank you, thank you all. Um, I'll be hanging around for just a little bit if you want to ask any questions one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but again, you can always reach out to either of us on yeah. LinkedIn or email. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.